So we move into this chapter on chemical and phase equilibrium. It's really about two-thirds or more chemical equilibrium and then a slight addition on phase equilibrium. So we go back and we say for equilibrium we need thermodynamic equilibrium. Think about chemical reactions so we have a, re a equation for the reaction and then you express that equilibrium in terms of equilibrium constants and an equation and an equation for what is the final mole percent of this component, this component, this component at this pressure and at this temperature in that mixture. Um, we like to work with ideal gases and if you work with uh, uh, the mounts then you can work with uh, mole fractions in ideal gas mixture. Uh, we don't work with solutions like a liquid, vapor, two-phase mixture for computation of the equilibrium composition, but when we talk about phase equilibrium, we we'll talk about you could have a solid phase, liquid phase, gaseous phase. So this is our basic equation in our chapter 14 that we deal with. So we'll have stoichiometric coefficients. This textbook uses the symbol nu. Okay, subscript A, subscript B, subscript C. So we have four stoichiometric coefficients in our general reaction equation where we have two reactants and two products. So C and D are products and A and B now, this is, if this is reversible, why don't we just switch the sides? Does it make a big difference? No, it really doesn't make a big difference, but it'll change that K. It'll, like, invert it for the equilibrium constant. And without any derivation, these are the two big equations that we use that you need to become familiar with. So we can have K. What was the name of K again? What was the name of K? equilibrium constant. Equilibrium constant and then they put K parenthesis T parenthesis. What does that mean? Is it K times temperature? It's a function. It's a function of temperature. That equilibrium constant is a function of temperature and we have a table we'll look it up for different reactions. But at equilibrium it's equal to what is this Y sub C? What is Y sub C? mole fraction, gas mixture. What is Y sub D? Mole fraction, a component D, Y sub A and Y sub B. If they're mole fractions, and I have only in the gas mixture A, B, C, and D, would the sum of those equal to one? Yeah. Now, sometimes we'll have something like Y sub A is in the mixture, Y sub B, Y sub C, Y sub D, plus Y sub inert gas. Something that's just not participating, but it's in the field. It's in the mixture. And then, okay, then I have a, a, a mole fraction of some non-participating inert gas. And yes, that changes the equation a little bit. Okay. So that would be like the nitrogen in the air. That's right. If the nitrogen, sometimes the nitrogen is viewed as participating and dissociating, sometimes it's not. Uh, if you had argon in the air, it doesn't participate. Um, and then, what about this P? What do you think P stands for? Pressure. Good job, right? We learned something. Good. Uh, P, pressure. Now, what about P ref? Reference pressure. What do you think is a good reference pressure? Atmospheric. Atmospheric, 1 atm. So everything's benchmarked around 1 atm. If you increase pressure above that, well, P divided by 1 atm gives you that ratio. Um, <clears throat> and then what is this? This is the sum of those stoichiometric coefficients. It's all of the products minus the sum over the reactants. <clears throat> Now let's take a look at this equation. How is it different? Is that K different? Well, they didn't emphasize it 
but I tried to write it exactly the same way the textbook writes it. But they just didn't emphasize that it's a function of temperature, but it's the same K. It is the same equilibrium constant. All right. <clears throat> How about uh, Ys versus N? What are, what are these Ns? They're the amounts. The amounts in kilomole or moles. Okay. What is this P over P ref? Uh, is that the same P and divided by the same P ref? Sure. But what's different right here? The total number. So N would be the number of moles of A plus the number of moles of B plus the number of moles of C plus the number of moles of D plus, if you have it, the number of moles of inert gas, if you have it. Sometimes you don't have it. A lot of times you don't have it. But if you do, that's, you would have to have it in the sum N because it does affect the mole fractions. Okay. And then, are th is this the same exponent? Yes, it is. And so, uh, <clears throat> what we find is uh, you can work in either mole fractions, Y's, or amounts, N's. It doesn't matter. It's what are your preferences. Okay. What's your preference? Uh, notice you could go back and forth between these. If all I do is substitute for N right there, okay, and then I have it to this power, nus of C plus nus of D minus nus of A minus nus of B, and I can bring it underneath. So I have N of C divided by N, N of D divided by N, N of A divided by N, and then those turn into mole fractions. So these equations aren't different, it's just how do you express it in terms of y's, mole fractions, or amounts, and does pressure influence the final equilibrium composition, you know, the y's? Yes, all the time. Yes, if the exponent, blah, 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 not equal to zero. Yes, if this exponent does equal to zero or no. That's a little embarrassing when I see a typo in my equation. There should be a closed parent right there, right? Oops. I don't know where that parenthesis went to, but disappeared. Now, what happens is, is this term P, if, uh, if you have a thing at two atmospheres, three atmospheres, and you change pressure, it does shift the equilibrium constant. I mean, not the constant, equilibrium comp comp composition, okay? But what happens if this term up here is equal to zero? I can change P all day and night. Uh, let's say it's three divided by one ATM to the zeroth power. What's the difference between that and two to the zeroth power or five over one to the zeroth power? Nothing, they all give us one. So it would always be multiplying by one here. This would be one if this was equal to zero. So when that sum of the stoichiometric coefficients of the products minus reactants is equal to zero, pressure does not influence the final equilibrium composition. So does pressure influence the final equilibrium composition? Yes, it does. In general, it does. But if it's not equal to zero, then it does. Because if it does equal to zero, well, then it doesn't. So the best answer is? Very good. Okay, does temperature influence the final equilibrium composition? Yes, all the time. Yes, if blah, blah, blah. Let's go ahead and start it. Does temperature influence the final equilibrium composition? All right, so, so does temperature, well, does temperature, uh, is temperature anywhere in this part of the equation? Is temperature anywhere in this part of the equation? No. Is temperature anywhere in the nus of C, nus of D? No, those are constants. Uh, does, is temperature anywhere in the Y sub C, Y sub D, Y sub A? Well, 
that's my answer that I'm looking for. I want to know if temperature influences the final equilibrium composition. I want to know if temperature influences the Ys. So I look over here, and uh, does temperature influence decay? Because it does, that if I change the temperature, the answer, the Ys, will change. The final equilibrium composition will change if I change the temperature. So um, does temperature influence the final equilibrium composition? Yes, it does. Because K is a function of temperature. There's nothing in here that says, well, yes, it would, but if K is a constant and never a function of temperature, then, well, but that's ridiculous. These things, the Ks are always a function of temperature. OK? So let's grade this one. There we go. There was an E. Somebody get, guessed an E. Let me go back and look. Hey, that's pretty good. That's okay. That's okay. So now we go to this table, table A27, one of the final tables in the textbook. We are introduced to this table. Here it is. And this is uh, examples of dissociation reaction equations. So here is one. Here's another dissociation. Here's another. These are pretty easy to understand. That's hydrogen and then disassociates to monoatomic hydrogen. Here is oxygen, disassociates from diatomic to monoatomic oxygen. And this is the same thing for nitrogen. Um, these, well, what it is is if you have oxygen and nitrogen in a mixture, then they can change where you see it's disassociating some of the oxygen, some of the nitrogen, and what are you producing? NO. It's an ox nitrous oxide, NO. What about this one? Well, I could take water and it could disassociate into hydrogen and oxygen. How about this one? Well, it's slightly different. It could dissociate to OH and hydrogen. Here's carbon dioxide dissociate into carbon monoxide and oxygen. And then carbon dioxide and hydrogen dissociate to produce carbon monoxide and water. Now, how come they didn't write this equation, CO plus H2O goes to CO2 and H2? Well, probably the same reason they didn't write this equation down here as O2O2s dissociate to O2. What? I told it. We're talking about dissociation reaction equations. I know that they're reversible, so really you could switch it around. But what, ha what we have on this column right here is temperature. What happens to temperature as I go down in the table? Does it increase, decrease? What's happening to temperature? It's going up. So for this easy equation right here, what do you think we get more of in the final equilibrium mixture? at high, 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 at, at you, as you increase temperature? Do you get more O2 or more O? More O. So it moves that way. It moves forward with increasing temperature. Now you can see that in these strong, large negative numbers, and then they get toward zero, and sometimes they'll actually cross over and become positive. Okay, for some of them. So that's the trend. They write it such that the equilibrium constant is large negative and then it goes uh, positive if it can at very, very high temperatures. A lot of times it just approaches zero. Well, what is approaching zero? Um, it's the log base 10 of the equilibrium constant. So I'm interested maybe in dissociation of carbon dioxide at 3,000 Kelvin. That's pretty hot. Here's the number out of the table, negative 0.485. If I want K, they report the log base 10 of K and put that in the table, negative 0.485. So if I want K, it's 10 to the negative 0 0.485. That's how you use the values in the tables. You 
you take 10 to that power to get k because they're putting the logarithm of base 10 into the, into the table. So um, the general trend is to write it such that it, at higher temperatures you get more p's, more products, than r's. The Gibbs free energy is a thermodynamic property. How many properties do we know about? Well, we know about pressure, temperature, specific volume, internal energy, enthalpy, entropy, flow exergy, or just exergy for, um, without the, for the flow. It's a little, there's a couple different exergies, but think about flow exergy. And then we have G, which is another thermodynamic property, Gibbs free energy. It was introduced way back in 1876 by Josiah Willard Gibbs at Princeton University, uh, probably the greatest American thermodynamicist. The Gibbs functions, the Gibbs uh, relationships in the thermo one that you were introduced to. And this property is useful in predicting whether a process will occur spontaneously at the given fixed constant temperature and fixed constant pressure. So this seems a little funny by definition, but kind of remember it's at constant temperature and constant pressure. And so here it is. It's, it's H minus TS. Have you seen S before? What is it? Entropy. T before? Temperature. H before? Enthalpy. And you would think, another grouping of parameters I already know about, and that's going to be useful? Well, trust me, it is. And a lot of times, they'll write it this way. They'll say, G is defined as H minus TS, but we're interested in the change in the function, the change in the Gibbs free energy. And that's equal to delta H minus t delta s. And you must say, that's an error. Why would a student think that's an error? Because, I, yeah, because you're thinking, OK, if g is defined this way, and h can change, and t can change, and s can change, then a change in the g would be a change in the h minus maybe a change in the T S minus T times a change in the S, something like that. But uh, you go back and what about this property? It predicts whether a process will occur spontaneously at constant. And so that's what they're using right here. That temperature is not changing. So the change is at a constant temperature is of the Gibbs free energy is just change in enthalpy minus T times the change in entropy. All right. It's a maximum non-expansion work for a process at constant temperature and pressure. There's a more physical, intuitive, now nah, I don't know what's that, intuitive, a more physical explanation of what it is. And then they relate it. They say, at equilibrium, it's equal to zero. If it's less than zero, you expect the reaction to move forward. It's a favorable reaction in the forward direction, and it's spontaneous, or it's fa re re a backward reaction is favored, and you would say that's um, spontaneous in the backward reaction, but not spontaneous in the forward reaction. Here's the derivation. Um, uh, do you want me to just outline this or, or wipe away this and reproduce it from scratch? Either one I can do. Some of these derivations get a little on the tedious and long side. I'm sorry? Just outline it? Well, you have all the tools to outline this derivation. And so what do we do when we have a process from state one to state two? Well. We think about the temperature and the pressure not changing. That's a given in this process. And we're interested in getting a maximum non-expansion work. Huh? 
Well, think about work. Think about boundary work and shaft work. And so we don't want to, we want to exclude the boundary work. The non-expansion work is the shaft work that we want to focus on. Okay, so what we do is we write this equation. What is this equation? First law of thermodynamics. Does it look familiar? Change in internal energy is equal to Q minus W. What did we neglect? Changes in macroscopic potential and kinetic energy changes, right? So we just had U, change in U. Then what we do is we say the work out, I'm working on this term right here, will be useful in boundary work. If it's constant pressure boundary work, the integral PdV is simple. It's just P times delta V. So then we stick it in and note the useful work is the change in the, well, the amount of heat transferred in during the process minus the change in the enthalpy. Okay, that looks familiar. Now we're done with the first law, put it to the side, let's go to the second law. Here's the second law of thermodynamics. Looks familiar. We have a change in entropy is equal to the entropy transfer with heat plus entropy generation. What did we do here to bring that temperature, 1 over temperature outside the integral? It's isothermal, constant temperature. So the temperature is not changing. So if you have a heat transfer, the temperature of the system stays constant. And so this is the Q in. Is that same Q in as this Q in? Sure. So let's isolate it. So Q in is equal to TDS minus T and then entropy generation in the process. Combine it into the useful work equation. So we find the useful work would be the negative change in enthalpy plus T delta S minus T times sigma. If you want the most out, if you want the maximum out, what do you think you're going to do with this entropy? It's a negative here times absolute temperature times sigma. If you want the maximum useful work out, sigma goes to zero. It becomes a reversible process. So otherwise, this would be a subtraction. All right, then you get what we set out to show was that the maximum useful work out for non-expansion work for process that's constant temperature, temp constant pressure is a change in the Gibbs free energy. So at equilibrium, it sets up our criteria for the equilibrium composition, the change is equal to zero. Okay, there's a longer def derivation, but uh, it's the same thing. Equilibrium criteria, they prove or show or demonstrate that the change in the Gibbs free energy at constant temperature, constant pressure is equal to zero. It's in the textbook, and the Gibbs free energy is related to the chemical potential and they do a little hand waving or a little work to get um, an expression for on a molar basis G bar how you have it related to the um, the enthalpy and temperature and entropy this chemical potential for ideal gases is the G bar and then you have this G bar naught that's at that atmospheric pressure that same criteria that we used on this S naught is at atmospheric pressure. And uh, for ideal gases, that change in S, you can see that equation coming in. We stick that into our general disassociation reaction equation, talking about the extent of the reaction, how much goes forward. If it goes forward, the amount of A goes down, the amount of B goes down, the amount of C goes up, and the amount of D goes up, and they're all related through those stoichiometric coefficients. So you can get the change in the amounts equal to the extent of reaction times the stoichiometric coefficient if it's minus for reactants and plus for products. Stick that into the equation for the change in the Gibbs function, grouping terms, 
for ideal gas mixtures only. Long equation, collect up the terms, and you have the change in the Gibbs function, atmospheric pressure, blah, 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 blah. Divided by R bar T is equal to the natural log, and you're bringing these especially from the, uh, uh, you can see that coming from the entropy part. The natural log or the partial pressure is divided by the reference pressure. So you pick up that natural log, blah, blah, blah. Grouping terms using rules of natural log. And then a little name calling. You say, well, the change in the Gibbs free energy atmospheric pressure divided by R bar T with a negative sign in front of it. Let's call that the log, natural log, of an equilibrium constant K, which is only a function of temperature. So the K is a, defined as E to the negative change in the Gibbs free energy divided by R bar T. Well, once you've introduced this equilibrium constant, then you can write it in a very compact form. Here are the two compact forms that we want to use. Version A, I call it, or version B, they're the same thing. One is in mole fractions, and one is in amounts. I'm always tempted to do what I used to do a lot of, and that is here's a blank board or a blank sheet of paper, and I'll just go through the derivation. Or I outline it like this. What do you prefer? The outline's fine. It's usually the consensus. And the half a lecture to three quarters of a lecture to do the derivation, the students are asleep in a few minutes. <laughs> and the comment is, is all he does is derive relationships. And he needs to solve more problems and example problems. So what we do is we press into application. Calculate the change in the Gibbs free energy for the decomposition of carbon dioxide at 298 Kelvin using enthalpy of formation and absolute entropy data. Huh? Then part B, calculate it using Gibbs function of formation data. Huh? Double huh? What? And then calculate the equilibrium constant from either result. Part A and Part B will give you the same result, but then you want to turn it into the equilibrium constant. All right. <clears throat> so what are we talking about? Let me get my sheet of paper here. So let's go back and write down the equation for the decomposition of carbon dioxide. CO2 dissociates into carbon monoxide and oxygen, and I need to have this balanced. And so I'm thinking about, okay, what are my coefficients? Let me always start with one here or something, fix something. Okay, let's start with one CO2. If it does dissociate, how much, what's the coefficient, stoichiometric coefficient in front of the CO? One. Why is it one? Carbon balance. Okay, what's the stoichiometric coefficient in front of the O2? One half. All right. Why, why is it one half and not one? Oxygen balance. Is it an O2 balance or an O balance? Well, take your pick, but most people work with O balance, just oxygen by itself, not diatomic oxygen balance, just oxygen balance. So we start with two oxygens here, and you have one there, and you need one there. And so uh, because of the one from here, then you need uh, one half O2s. That gives you one. Okay, very good. Now that we have the balanced uh, dissociation reaction equation, what is the enthalpy formation and absolute entropy data? Well, we, we have to go back and calculate this molar Gibbs function at atmospheric pressure for each of those constituents, carbon monoxide, oxygen, add carbon dioxide. 
Well, what's the basic equation for that one? It's the enthalpy of formation on a molar basis minus that temperature, which is 298, times the entropy for the carbon monoxide and carbon monoxide for both of those. So I look up the enthalpy of formation of carbon monoxide. It's negative 110, 530 uh, kilojoules per kilomole. Where did that come from? Yeah, the pa that t table um, A25. That's exactly right. Then I have minus 298 Kelvin times this S bar naught. That's that absolute entropy. And that is also in table A25 at 298 on ATM for carbon monoxide. That comes in at 197.54 kilojoules per kilomole Kelvin. So we calculate a uh, final value for that one. What about uh, for the oxygen? Same thing. We pick up for the oxygen zero for the enthalpy formation, minus 298 Kelvin times the absolute entropy, 205.03 uh, kilojoules per kilomole Kelvin. How about for the carbon dioxide? Carbon dioxide, let's go ahead and look at its negative 393,520 minus the 298. Ah, oh, come on, 298. I can write it. 298 Kelvin times absolute entropy of carbon dioxide, 213.8. 69 kilojoules per kilomole Kelvin. Okay. So I have one question. On the table, the Gibbs function for the oxygen is it says zero. Oh, uh, um, that's the Gibbs function of formation. And what we're going to do is let me finish this and then we're going to use for part B, we'll use that information. The Gibbs function of formation. Yeah, yeah. All right, and so uh, um, did I get the values right? Enthalpy formation, oxygen, yes, and then two hundred five, yes. Okay, so the, the change in the the Gibbs free energy for the decomposition is um, the stoichiometric coefficient of the carbon monoxide times G bar naught of CO plus stoichiometric coefficient of the oxygen, G bar naught oxygen, minus stoichiometric coefficient of CO2, G bar naught CO2. All right, so um, you stick the values in there and you should get negative, not negative, positive 257 comma 257 comma 253 kilojoules per kilomole. All right, how about, uh, so that's calculating the change in the Gibbs free energy for the decomposition. So for part A, the delta G bar not equal 257. I'm going to leave more digits on there or just round it off. That's good enough. Kilojoules per kilomole. It's really hard to have more than four digits. Okay, but we're just using data out of tables, so just get those values. All right. What about the, um, the values equal to the uh, Gibbs formation of the carbon uh, uh, monoxide plus one-half times the Gibbs function of formation 
of the oxygen minus one times Gibbs function of formation for the carbon dioxide. Okay, so let me get these values out of that column, out of table A25, and for the carbon monoxide, 197.54 plus one half times give function of formation for the oxygen, zero. I'm, I misread that one, sorry. Yeah, negative one three seven one five zero plus zero minus one times for the carbon dioxide negative three nine four comma three eight zero. Let me do that. Let me ask you to run that number and compare it. All right, so you got 230. Okay. So we're using that Gibbs function of formation values. And now the last part, calculate. So they give us the same answer for that Gibbs free energy of, for that reaction decomposition. But calculate the equilibrium constant at this 298 Kelvin. Well, we recall that I need to scoot down just a little bit. We recall that the, uh, the, uh, the natural log of K is equal to negative delta G bar naught divided by R bar T. Okay, so we put in negative of 257 comma 2, I forget what I used, 230. And then we divide by 8.314 and the temperature is 298. Hence, you get negative 103.82. Okay, well, I need K, so that's going to be e to the minus 103.82, which is a very small number on your calculator. And so, if I wanted to, I'd say, well, I want to know what is the value that would put into the table. But the value that they put into the table, I think I have it on the next slide. Let me see if I do. Nope. Is 8.1324 Yeah, very negative 46 or something. So what you want to do is you want to say, well, they're going to report the log base 10 of K and put that in the table. So what is the log base 10? It should be around negative 45.07. So do that. Do, see if you agree there. So you get this very small number. Let me go ahead and write it out. eight point one five seven times ten to the minus forty six but nobody wants to put that number in there so they take the log base ten of that and put that in and it's negative forty five point oh eight something this is eight eight or something okay and so that, that's what they would put into the table. If you take a look at our table, A27 for dissociation of carbon dioxide, CO2, at 298, you get negative 45.066. So the table value is negative 45.066. It's good enough for agreement given that I dropped some digits here and there. 
Okay. Now, once you have the equilibrium constants, it's more of now computing the, uh, the final equilibrium compositions. So let's solve this problem. A gaseous mixture at 800 Kelvin and 3 ATMs with a molar analysis of 10% carbon dioxide, 80% carbon monoxide, and 10% oxygen enters a heat exchanger and is heated at constant pressure. Let me stop. Uh, so we read up to this period right here. Okay. You understand we have 10%, 80%, and 10%. If that adds up, it's 100%. They're giving us mole fractions, aren't they? And so there's three components coming in, CO2, CO, and O2. Those three actors we just talked about in a reaction equation. Um, it comes in at 800 Kelvin and 3 ATM. Do you think it's coming in already in equilibrium or not? Let's take a vote. Is this A, in equilibrium, or B, not in equilibrium? The inlet, what comes in? I think it's in equilibrium. You answer A. You say, no, it's, I, it, nothing in the problem says it's in equilibrium. I don't think it's in equilibrium. Answer B. All right, so we're there. Let's take a look. Well, I don't know how to explain it, but where is anything in the problem statement in that first sentence that says this is an equilibrium mixture? There's nowhere. It says nothing about it. Okay. Um, I could calculate to see if it was an equilibrium mixture. Should we do that? I didn't plan on doing that, but we can. It's a few steps to see it if it would be in equilibrium. You want to do that? Well, I think half of us are a little confused. It's not in equilibrium. There's nothing to say it is. It's a little bit of work to prove it, but if it's in equilibrium, it's a very special case. And looking at it, there's a lot of CO in there. And the only way you're going to get a lot of CO in there is with high temperature. Otherwise, it's going to be happy in CO2. And coming in at 800 Kelvin, yeah, it's hot, but not that hot. All right. Okay, let's vote. Do we want to prove it or not prove it that this is not in equilibrium? Prove it. Okay, so what you do is you go back to our equilibrium equation. What was our equilibrium equation with the Ks? We had the stoichiometric coefficient. Okay. Me no find. All right, so here's our uh, CO2 dissociates to CO plus one half O2. True? And we know that at 800 Kelvin, I could go to the table at 800 Kelvin. Great, they don't have it at 800. Okay, quickly change it. Let's make it 1,000 Kelvin, so I don't have to interpolate. It's not going to be, if it's, not, it's not in equilibrium, but let's say it's 1,000 Kelvin. So I find that the constant is, uh, K is equal to 10 to the minus 10.221. Uh, uh, true? You see where we get that number out of table A27? Well, what's our equation for K? You want to write it in terms of mole fractions? The mole fraction of carbon monoxide, mole fraction of oxygen, divided by the mole fraction of carbon dioxide. I know I didn't account for those stoichiometric coefficients. Let's now account for them. But I'd like to put the two products over the reactant first. Now let's put our stoichiometric coefficient. It's 1 here. It's square root or 1 half there and 1 there. Okay, that's good. And then, what do I have as I have P over P ref to the power 1 plus 1 half minus 1. That's our general equation for 
equilibrium in terms of mole fractions. Let me pause for a minute. Did I, did I get this correct? Give me a thumbs up if I did. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Couple more, please. Nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. Because if I'm not correct, you know, <laughs> then we're dead in the water. So now let's substitute some values here and see if the right hand side does equal the left hand side. This is from, you might want to say, this is if it's in equilibrium, the right hand side will equal 10 to the minus 0.221. 10 to the minus 10.221. So let's put in a value. Y naught is 0.8 to the 1 power, 0.1 to the 1 half, 0.1. And we said 3 divided by 1 to the 1 half power. OK. So let's just see if they work. So uh, 10.221, change sign. Um, so is 6.0117 times 10 to the minus 11 equal to, and on this side we have uh, 4.3818. You tell me. True or false? false? False. I have way too much CO2 to be in equilibrium. Way too much. Okay. Now, that non-equilibrium mixture comes in and is into a heat exchanger and is heated at constant pressure. And it goes out at 3,000 Kelvin and 3 ATM. Determine, it, when it's an equilibrium mixture, determine the molar analysis of the exiting mixture. I want to know how much is CO2, how much is CO, and how much O2 goes out. Yes, sir? Wouldn't it, by saying that it's going to be heated at constant pressure, wouldn't it tell you that it's not equilibrium anyways because the Yeah, we kind of did that first step to see that it's not coming in in equilibrium. But we're going to heat it up. And when you heat it up, what comes out is an equilibrium mixture by the problem statement. So it's saying, by, by it saying heated and then looking for equilibrium mixture, that should tell you anyway that it's not an equilibrium That's mixture. right. That's what you use to uh, justify. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, but a little bit of insight from solving lots of problems goes a long way. They call that experience or something like that, right? So, uh, so now what we want to do is we want to determine this. Now, this is a long process because we have an equilibrium uh, reaction equation. So this is what we just learned, if that works for you, is that we know, we know that... Um, that uh, K is equal to the, and I'm going to put it in amounts in terms of N instead of Y's. So let's write it in terms of N's, the amounts. We're going to have the amount coming out in equilibrium of carbon monoxide, the amount coming out of O2 to the one-half power, and the amount of CO2 coming out. So all three come out in equilibrium. Okay, and then we have the pressure divided by the reference pressure divided by the total amount coming out, all raised to the one-half power. I, I, I have one plus a half minus one that just gives me a half. Okay, so this is one equation, but the, the, the total amount is the number of moles of CO plus the number of moles of O2 plus the number of moles of CO2. So I could it, get rid of that N there, and I'd have the amount of CO, O2 to the one-half, CO2. I'd have P divided by P ref, and then I'd have 
CO plus O2 plus CO2 all to the one-half power. Now, I look at that equation and I say, I don't know how much CO is going out, how much O2 is going out, or CO2 coming out. I have three unknowns. What are they? Just what I said, the amounts O2 can't spell. Come on now. Okay, those are my three unknowns. Let me back up. Do I know K in that equation? Because they give me the temperature. They're nice. And so I go to the, my table and I get the temperature. It's 10 to the minus something for that K. Do I know the P in this equation? Yes, they gave me the P. Do I know P reference? Always one ATM. Don't make life complicated. Okay. All right. So I really have three unknowns. I have one equation, three unknowns. Go get them, mathematician. Is it going to work? Well, it's a nonlinear equation. That then makes things harder, not easier. Are you going to be able to solve one equation and three unknowns? No. With confidence or just because the instructor thinks not? Is it with confidence? Is just think about it, okay? So go back to statics and all that when you're really bringing math into application and try to put together why did you go around in circles often? And you often went in circles because you had, you know, uh, one equation with two unknowns and you really worked really hard trying to solve for the unknowns. And it didn't work. And you had to get, oh, I need three equations and three unknowns. And you have to get the right number of equations, unknowns. So this is an equation which represents a combination of some thermodynamic properties to give us that equilibrium composition, right? Gibbs free energy minimized. Okay, where am I going to get some other equations? It's not that hard. Where do I get it? It's mass or amount. Did you say mass? I said ideal gas. Ideal gas. No, he said mass. <laughs> he gave the right answer. What do you mean by amount or mass? What do you mean? How's that going to help? Whatever comes in goes out. If I have five kilograms per second coming in, how many kilograms per second should go out? Uh, you should see some s clever solutions I've seen on final exams. <laughs> you get five kilograms in and 20 kilograms out. What? How'd that work? I think we missed up in thermo one. True? So think back. In chemistry, what else is balanced, not just mass? Amounts, amounts. Do you think the amount of carbon in is equal to the amount of carbon out? Carbon is going to be balanced. That gives me an additional equation. So I have some thermodynamics, gives free energy, equilibrium. I have a carbon balance. I got two equations. I still have three unknowns. I need one more equation. Oxygen balance. So let's just write it up this way. I come in with the certain known in amount of carbon. Okay. So, and then I'm going to have so much go out. I have to have some starting point. So do this. Say N is equal to one kilomole in. What do you mean by N? I have a mixture coming in, but I'm going to say the mixture is just one kilomole of mixture coming in. True? And I say to myself, how much carbon comes in with that one kilomole of that mixture coming in? Well, the mixture was... How much CO? I think it was 80% CO and 10% CO2. So what comes in is 10% uh, CO2 as a reminder, 80% CO and 10% O2. True? So if I had, that means I have one kilomole of CO2 coming in. So I'm going to have, for each kilomole of CO2 coming in, I'll have one 
kilomole of oxygen. I'm not oxygen, carbon. I'm doing the carbon balance. And then I'll have one for every CO, and I'll have nothing coming with that 10% of the oxygen. There's just no carbon with the oxygen coming in. True? So do the math. What do we get? We get 0.8 plus 0.1. That's equal to 0.9. That has to be what goes out. What goes out? Well, I don't know how much CO goes out, but for every CO that goes out, there's one C that goes with it. I don't know how much CO2 goes out, but for every CO2 that goes out, let me keep them in the same order because I, I had the order over here. This was the amount of CO2 um, coming in. This was amount of CO coming in, and this was the amount of O2 coming in. Okay, I'll try and keep them in the right order. CO2 coming out, and then I'll have one for the amount CO going out, and then I'll have zero for the oxygen coming out. And so what I'll have is I'll have one N CO2 plus one and O2. I dropped the out because this is what I'm focusing on. These are my unknowns, but they're coming out in equilibrium. Let's do the next balance, which is an oxygen balance. So I'll have 2 times 0.1 for the carbon dioxide coming in. Why do I have a 2 in front? Because 2 oxygens per CO2. And then I'll have 1 times 0.8. Why do I have a 1? There's only one oxygen in every CO. And then I'll have 2 times 0.1. Why? Why? Why again do I have that? So, so for every kilomole of the inlet gas, how many kilomoles of oxygen come in? 1.2. Did I do the math correct? And 0 0.9 kilomoles of carbon come in, 1.2 kilomoles of oxygen come in. Did that make sense? And then how does it go out? Well, I'll have 2 for every CO2. I'll have 1 for every CO. And I'll have 2 for every CO, I mean O2. So if I could say this is an oxygen balance equation, oh, sorry, carbon balance equation, oxygen balance equation, and this is my equilibrium equation, those are my three equations, three unknowns. Leave it to the mathematicians. The engineering is done. Sorry. Nope, nope, nope. You have to do it. Okay. Well, three equations, three unknowns. That doesn't sound that bad. How am I going to solve it? Well, the problem is, is one of the equations... NL, nonlinear. It's algebraic, but it's nonlinear. So you're going to use your calculator. And by this week, for that last and final exam for this class, you will need to solve nonlinear algebraic equations using your root finder. Using your root finder. Some of you already know how to do it, but I'm telling you, you better be prepared. It's not a guarantee, but it's like 80% probability you'll have to do it on the exam. All right? That's pretty high. Yes, sir. I have a question. Under uh, the odd section for the, uh, for the carbon, is that definitely uh, the uh, uh, end of the CO instead of oxygen? Okay. Right here? No, uh, for, for, the, for the carbon. This one? Oh, yeah, this is definitely CO. Sorry. CO. Why did I write O2? I have no idea. I'm having a hard time today. Thank you. No idea why I wrote that. Wrong. Okay. So now what we want to do is uh, the strategy is to say, instead of having three unknowns and three equations, can I collapse it to one unknown and one equation? Yeah, let's try that. And so the book will do this. And they'll say, I'm going to introduce the Z. What's Z? 
They didn't want to use X because students think quality. Have we used Z for anything yet? No, let's use Z. All right. So Z will be the amount of carbon monoxide in the outlet, if that's true. From this equation right here, every time I see the amount of carbon dioxide in the outlet, it's 0 0.9 minus Z. I can now replace it. True? That's how you eliminate and reduce to get one equation with one unknown. What's going to be our unknown? Z. What does Z stand for? The amount of CO in the outlet. Let's go to this equation then. I'll say that uh, one, let me do this one. The amount of O2 is equal to 0 0.6 minus the amount of CO2 minus one half amount of CO. I didn't make a mistake yet, I hope. Then we'll put 0 0.6 minus, oh, I could substitute 0 0.9 minus Z for the amount of CO2. And I could put Z for the amount of CO. I can clean it up a little bit, negative 0.3 plus 1 half Z. So anytime I see the amount of oxygen, I'll just replace it by 0.3 plus 1 half z. So I'm going to come up to this last equation and substitute those results. As an aside, let me do the total number, which is the number of moles of CO plus the number of moles of O2 plus the number of moles of CO2, which will be z plus negative 0.3 plus one-half Z plus 0.9 minus Z. And I'm going to have to scroll down. I don't really like to, but I'll cancel this Z, that Z. i scroll down just a little bit. Ah, ah fine. N is equal to 0.6 plus one-half Z. Does that make sense? So I did a little work, now I'm ready to come back to this equation right up here, and I'm going to say, for my one equation with one unknown, K is equal to number of moles of CO, that will be Z, times the square root of number of moles of O2, uh, one-half Z minus 0.3. All right, divided by number of moles of CO2, 0 0.9 minus Z. All of that times my pref pressure, 3 atm, divided by 1 atm, reference pressure, times the total N, which is uh, 0 0.6 plus Z over 2 all to the one-half power. And for this problem, it was 3,000 Kelvin. 3,000 Kelvin for that reaction equation. That K is 10 to the negative 0.485. That makes sense? How many unknowns are in this final equation? What is the name of the unknown? Z. And I have to do root finding to solve for it. How about how many people feel they could get this value of Z on their calculator within the next 10 minutes if their life depended on it? Nobody? You could do it? No? No, sorry. Got to do it with the calculator that's approved, which is not that much different. All right. Well, let me do this. Let me jump to another slide. Oh. 
what happened. That messed up. So, uh, how many people know Jeffrey? So, he said a lot of people use the TI 30X Pro. Here are all the keystrokes to solve for that problem. <laughs> Everyone. Uh, another student, Song, he said, Oops, oh, I got rid of songs. But Song did it too. And he said, Too many keystrokes, Jeffrey. So, he had it in fewer keystrokes. Um, I've done this before so you can look at previous lectures and see more detail where I actually stepped through for the TI-30, which a lot of people use. Um, you can also do it very well with the Casio. I used to say the Casio was a little easier, but uh, people argued with me and then showed me, no, no, look, at just as easy with the TI. Okay? Uh, you have to get either the online manual for your calculator and look at it, or the paper copy, which nobody gets anymore, of a manual. Nobody gets a paper copy when they buy a calculator. It's all online. Okay? But you need to find it and solve that nonlinear equation. What was the final answer? Um, you know, that's a great question. I can't remember. <clears throat> but this is how you set it up as a function of z to zero it out. You put that to the other side. You have all of it, and you just... Okay? You should probably do it a couple times by hand as well. It's really not hard to do by hand. Manually iterate. How many people would know what's going on behind the scenes, like what's some buzzword for the algorithm your calculator is implementing to do the root finding, given your numerical methods class? Newton yeah, Newton Rapson. Or bisection or secant method or something like that. Okay? Well, uh, so. I already did all that. Did all that. You ready to solve for another problem? Okay. Calculate the temperature at which 2% of diatomic hydrogen disassociates into a monatomic hydrogen at a pressure of 10 atm. So you have pure hydrogen. But then you heat it up at high pressure, and it doesn't say pure diatomic hydrogen. Some of it disassociates. And it says, tell me what temperature I need to bring it up to such that 2% of what started as diatomic is now disassociated. Okay, well, what's the reaction equation? H2 goes to two H's. And if you cool it back down, it'll go back to H2, right? Diatomic. Okay. And so we look at our reaction equation. We have a, a K equilibrium constant is equal to the amount of hydrogen divided to the power 2 to the amount of diatomic hydrogen. Pressure divided by reference pressure divided by the total amount to the power 2 minus 1, which is 1. 2 minus 1 is 1, okay? All right. Um, I have to struggle with this information that 2% of the di So I start out with 100% is just H2, and I heat it up. And then what happens? I have point, so let me do this. I'll start with 1 kilomole of H2. Okay, so what do I left with? 0.98 kilomoles of H2. Isn't that where saying, hey, 98% didn't disassociate. 2% did disassociate. True? So this is the start. This is the end. If I have 0.98 kilomoles of H2, how many kilomoles of H do I have? Do I have 0 0.02 kilomoles? That, let's do a clicker question. Or do I have 0 0.04 kilomoles 
of H, or do I have zero kilomoles of H? Answer A, B, C, or other answer D. I'm struggling with this concept that 2% of the diatomic hydrogen disassociates. If that's true, how many, and I start with one kilomole of hydrogen, how many kilomoles of H by itself, monoatomic hydrogen, is left? I'll give you a little more time. Right. Well, shall I just look at the results to see where we stand? Hmm. Well, maybe I don't want to look at the results then. Huh? All right. Well, hmm. Let me do this. If 100% of the one kilomole of diatomic would have completely disassociated, how many kilomoles of H monoatomic would I have? You'd have two. You'd have two. This is the challenge with this. See? Two gives you, I'm sorry, one gives you two. For every one that dissociates, you get two monoatomics. So, how much did disassociate? 0.02 did disassociate, which gives us 0.04 kilomoles of H. What? Not even 50%. How did that happen? Pardon? Oh, you thought it was H2. Oh, no, no, it's H. So, okay, now, if we have, let me clean this up now. So we have 0.04 kilomoles of H in the products in the final equilibrium mix. What is then the total N? N to start with was 1. What's the N to end with? The total amount. 1.02 kilomoles. See that? So now what we could do is we could come up here to this equation. We can say we're looking for the temperature that gives us an equilibrium constant K such that the amount of H2, I can just put in here 0.04, the amount of H, I'm sorry, squared, divided by the amount of H2, 0.98, to 10 ATM divided by 1 ATM, divided by the total N, 1.02, raised to the power 1. So we, we just jump on our calculator and say that's what K has to equal. We need to get it that hot such that K equals this. How many people get something like that? But they don't report K's in the tables, do they? They report what? Log base 10. So give me the log base 10 of that K. So log base 10 of that K is equal to okay make sure you can get that number and then go back and forth with that equation so if I take 
10 to the negative 1.796, do I get 0 0.0160? Yeah. Make sure you go back and forth. Don't mess up. Throw away points just for little errors. So now I go to the table. I think I have it here. And I look for the dissociation of hydrogen. And I want negative 1.7 that's fall, it's right in here, negative 1.796. True? Doesn't it fall between these two values? So the temperature is going to be between 2,900 and 3,000 Kelvin. I know that there's a fancier interpolation. We're just going to do linear interpolation. But if you, you want, you can do a little fancier interpolation, a little more accurate. And you get that the temperature is... Your computer is about to restart. Crap. Why is my computer going to do this? UTSA OIT, but I don't want to restart. Well, we're going to take a break, class. <laughs> this is the craziest. I can't even get rid of this. I got to stop my. St